Vivian, thank you for joining us today. We're really excited to speak with you. Um, you know, it's it's obvious, um, and it's obvious to say that you're greatly admired within the hard rock music community, but really also within the guitar community. Um, you know, it's 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 a tough crowd sometimes with guitarists, but there's just like a hundred percent consensus love about you know your legacy and your playing um, and everything you've been a part of, which is pretty awesome. And you know what we wanted to do today was you have so many fans from so many different eras, right? So like there's people who grew up from the Dio stuff and there's people who like love the River Dogs album and then, you know, going mm. into Leopard, like kind of my era, and then obviously with Last in Line. So what we wanted to do today was kind of like honor the legacy because everyone's got like different Vivian eras. Like they love that guitar, they love that. So what we want to do today was kind of like step through that legacy. And so everyone's going to kind of take a little bit of piece of this uh, with them. Um so, you know, we obviously know that your guitar heroes play with Les Pauls and you, you obviously deviated, you know, into super strats with awesome graphics and all different stuff. So what we're going to do is start from the beginning and really talk about your first guitar and really how did you learn the instrument? You know, was it, did you pick things up by ear? Was it based on lessons? Well, it's funny you say, yeah, most of my guitar heroes were Les Paul players, um, but my very first guitar hero was a Strat player, and that was Rory Gallagher. Um, and that was, I mean, you know, you can go back further and say, like, the very first person that, that turned me on to music uh, was actually playing a Les Paul, and that was Mark Bolin, T-Rex, Top of the Pops, early 1970s. So that's when I had the light bulb moment, and I, I, I thought, I want to grow my hair, going to wear my sister's clothes. <laughs> You know, that's what I'm going to do with my life. So, um, you know, and I, I pastored my parents to get me a guitar. And, you know, I'm a kid. I'm like nine years old or something, 10 years old, maybe. And so obviously they didn't take me seriously. They said, yeah, 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 whatever. And so I kept on all year and we're coming up to Christmas, you know, and like, can I have a guitar? I want a guitar, I want a guitar. So eventually, uh, I, I mean, I remember having here's the chronology as weird as it is my father i don't know where the fact he found this but one night he came home with a friggin ukulele <laughs> and said here and i went that's not a guitar that's a ukulele and so anyway so i maybe you know <laughs> hacked on that for a month or two i kept at him can i have a guitar can i have a guitar eventually uh my, my father i got, I got a special shout out he was the original vivian campbell that was his name um and he was the, my enabler without my father i would not have had a career because um you know i kept going on to them and he at some point he saw that this is really what i wanted to do and and he facilitated as much as he could uh that's not to say that everything was handed to me not not at all but um he uh you know at various points in in my formative years he was the one who stepped in and kind of saved the day for me so um I did get an acoustic guitar at one stage, and I remember it. Uh, I broke all the strings until I only had the two fat strings left, like the E and the A. And and it was I was entirely self-taught. Not that I wanted to be. I just couldn't find anyone to teach me. But um, it was then that I realized I was I didn't know how to tune a guitar, and I was I'd broken four of the strings, and I I I tuned to. Um, I tuned to E, I didn't know this at the time, but the E and then a B on the A string. So I was playing a fifth. So it was like a chord. It was like rock sound. Like, oh, that sounds like something, you know, that I've heard. I've heard bands play. And so um, anyway, I, I moved on from there. I, I eventually pastored my parents into getting me uh, a little cheap, like 25 pound electric guitar for Christmas one year and I was probably around 11 or 12 at this time and it was an SG shape I remember it was the company I made it was called Arbiter um, and it was an SG shape and it had one single coil pickup uh, and it was a piece of crap I mean it was just not playable really but and I didn't have an amp but I had an electric guitar. It was at that time in my life, it was important for me to have an electric guitar because that's what I wanted to play. Yeah. You know, acoustics, great and all, but I wanted to play electric guitar. Um, it didn't matter. I didn't have an amp. <laughs> so, and then I went through a few other guitars, uh, eventually sort of bartering my way. I, I worked for this. I mean, like I said, it's not like my parents give me everything, but they helped, my father in particular helped get me started. And then I would work weekends and holidays and stuff. I saved money. I was singular in my focus as a as a teen 
from my early teens all the way through to be a guitar player. And everything in my life was about earning money to buy guitars, amps, strings, effects, pedals, all that stuff. Um, and so I remember from that guitar, I had a Watkins Rapier 33. I don't know if either of you even know what that no. is. That was Watkins were an English company, I believe, and they made Wham, like the amplifiers. I had one of those also um, at a Wham combo at one stage. Uh, but it was sort of like a loosely based on a Stratocaster style, but much more rounded, three single coil pickups from what I remember. Mine was red with white, um, but it was actually a, a proper playable guitar. Um, I, you know, I had a few. My, now that I'm gotten talking about it, I'm thinking about others. I kind of traded as we went along but um maybe actually before the watkins i had out of a catalog like big catalog that was that thick that my mother used to get i don't know where they came from but there was everything in this catalog from like women's shoes to electric guitars <laughs> to car parts and everything in between and so i looked through this oh electric guitars and they were new and shiny and so now that i remember this i i had a strat it was natural wood with a white pick guard, maple neck. I mean, it wasn't a real Strat. It was some copy, some nameless copy. But it was, you know, it was a step up. I was sort of incrementally going through all of this. Um, I just, I can't remember if that was before or after the Watkins Rip Year 33. But those were both kind of guitars where you could really actually almost play. And all through this time, I was teaching myself. Like I say, I, I couldn't find a teacher but anytime I came across anyone who had a guitar or knew anything about the guitar, I'd be, please, please, please show me, show me a chord, show me something. Wow. And, you know, so amazingly, I kind of learned, I don't know how we didn't have the Internet. You know, I don't know how I figured out how to play guitar, but slowly I did. And it was slowly. I mean, it took a long time. Um, I remember when I was 12, uh there were two very, very pretty girls in, in my school. They were twins. I mean, they were almost identical twins. And um, so I was in love with both of them because they were just real pretty. But uh, <laughs> So I, I went around to their house one Saturday afternoon on a supposed date. Like when you're 12, like, yeah, I don't know what that involves. But uh, I walked in the house and there's a Spanish guitar in the corner. Oh. And I said, oh, you play guitar? And oh, no, our mother plays guitar. I spent the entire afternoon sitting with their mother <laughs> and she she showed me the lick for day tripper that's amazing and, I, da, 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 and that was it that was amazing. so i never got a second date which was just as well i suppose because <laughs> i couldn't decide which of the twins was prettier um but um yeah so you know little things like that i remember somebody who, who worked with my father had a guitar and he showed me a d chord like a first position d chord and i was just so thrilled wow. to learn like oh man and, uh, and obviously showing me how to tune a guitar that was a big plus too <laughs> and this is the days before we had guitar tuners so you had to tune by ear um my parents had a piano in the house i remember i took piano lessons from a lady nearby because it was easy to get piano lessons because that was a real instrument um i took piano lessons for a couple of months um i quit after i'd learned how to tune a guitar <laughs> like okay so which notes A and which notes A? And so I learned the note. Okay, so it's E A D G B E. Okay, um, thanks. I'll see you later. So I finally learned how to tune the guitar, and we had the piano at home. So I, that was my frame of reference, even though the piano wasn't very much in tune. So who knows back then? Like when I think back to the early Sweet Savage days, we used to rehearse in a shed up at my parents' house. And, you know, like I said, we didn't have guitar tuners and nobody thought to use like a tuning fork. Right. So we'd go into the house and we'd take our, our reference from this out of tune piano. So we were probably never really in pitch, right. with love, you know. Um, so anyway, that was it. Uh, and then when I was about 15, I was working all summer. Rory Gallagher was my first guitar hero, just to backtrack a bit. My cousin Richard... Um, in 19, Christmas of 1972, I was 10 years old. He bought me my first album. It was Live in Europe 72, Rory Gallagher. So this is my first piece of vinyl. Wow. And I'm listening to this, and I listened to it all night. I remember I stayed up all Christmas night, because you can do that when you're a kid, just listen to this album over and over and over again. And uh, Rory also, you know, this is Belfast in 1970, so nobody played there. 
because of the troubles. Uh, but Rory would always come every Christmas and he would play a, a series of shows at the Ulster Hall. Um, so I remember going to see the see Rory at, at Christmas. I, I don't think it was that year. I think it was the following year. 73 was probably the first year I saw him. And then 74, 75, 76, 77, every Christmas he'd play in Belfast and I'd be there. So Rory was the first album, first guitar hero. I remember meeting him when I was a kid, got him to sign my ticket stub, and he was just wow. a lovely gentleman. Um, so that was it. You know, I wanted the Strat, and I was 15, and I remember I was working all summer and uh, I was trying to save up money because this is like I was having to step up to a real guitar here. Right. I needed some, some serious bank to make this happen. Um, and I wasn't quite going to get there. Now, my birthday is August 25th, the end of summer. And I remember it was a Friday and, and my father came to pick me up at work. And uh, I was I was short of my goal to buy a Stratocaster. And uh, he showed up and he says, happy birthday. I got something for you. So he, he opened the, the boot of the car, the trunk, as you Americans call it. And in there was a guitar case. And I was getting really excited because it said Fender on it. And I opened up and it wasn't a Stratocaster. It was a Fender Telecaster thin line. Do you remember okay. those with the two humbuckers? Yeah, 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 yeah. So like maple with maple neck, white pick guard. It's still a proper guitar. Would, I didn't know what to think. I was so stoked it was a real Fender, you know, and my father knew that I wasn't going to be able to afford to buy the Stratocaster. And he kind of thought that that's what I wanted. That's fine. So <laughs> anyways, it was like, yeah, all right. Uh, but it was a real guitar. It said yeah. Fender on the headstock, you know. Um, so I took that home. I played that. Um, and after that, I traded that uh, because what, what I had that for a couple of years and then in during that time, I uh, I'd worked up to a Les Paul, and I discovered Scott Gorham, Brian Robertson, Thin Lizzy, and through them, Gary Moore, like my ultimate guitar hero. And, and so all three of those guys were Les Paul murderers, Gary Moore in particular. <laughs> so that was it. I wanted the Les Paul. So um, I kind of skipped it, the real Stratocaster stage, yeah. and, and I traded the, the Telecaster Thin Line on... Uh, on my first Les Paul. Is it for the sound of the Les Paul that attracted you or the looks of the, of the Les Paul at that time? Mm. Once I heard Gary Moore, I knew it was the sound. <laughs> um, but the looks, yeah, I always loved the way a Les Paul looked. I'd say if you'd ask me to choose between a Les Paul and a Strat in terms of aesthetic appearance, I always preferred the Les Paul. I always thought that was more rock and roll, you know, because going back to bowling, he played a bunch of different – I saw him play a Strat on TV. I saw him play a Les Paul. I saw him play a Flying V. But the first time I saw him, he had that Les Paul. And it's just – that was kind of the iconic look to me, was a lot of hair and a Les Paul. You know? <laughs> okay, so at the beginning of your professional career, when you started with Sweet Savage, and then when you went into the deal, you had one guitar always that always shone and came into the front, which is your 77. Is it 77 or 78? It's a Deluxe? 77, I believe. It's 72987537. I've been told by clever people on the internet that that's a 1977. I'm not sure. So, you actually have it right here. So I've been playing. I've been using this guitar more wow. and more and more. That's awesome. Um, so it, it's gone through a lot over the years, you know, um, different pickups, different color. I mean, it, it was a wine red deluxe. How, how did you get that? What's the story behind these? Guys? Like, how did you get it? Well, I ordered a gold Les Paul standard. Um, but you know, I ordered it from a little tiny strip mall, mom and pop guitar music shop. Um, you know, they weren't even a guitar shop. I mean, they sold like accordions and harmonicas and kazoos and stuff like that uh, and sheet music you know and then so it's not like guitar center you can't go in there and, and look at like 800 shiny new guitars and go well i should have that one or that i can't decide you know so i ordered a gold les paul standard i paid a deposit for it and um i i waited for months and months and months and and about once a week i'd get off the school bus and i'd go to the, the store and I'd say Any, anything yet and they go no nothing yet and then one one Friday um, they said well there's good news and bad news we got a Les Paul it's not a standard and it's not gold so it was a wine red deluxe with the little mini buckers um, and at the time Scott Gorham 
played a sunburst Les Paul Deluxe mm -hmm. with Thin Lizzy, and I'd be watching him on top of the pops, and I just thought, and you know, it's good enough for Scott Gorham, it's good enough for me. So, and I'd waited for months and months. I didn't want to wait any longer, so I took the guitar, and that night I took sandpaper to it to take the shine off of it, uh, because again, going back, remember Rory Gallagher's my first guitar hero. His guitar practically had no paint. So I, to this day still, I, I don't particularly like shiny guitars. Um, I, I like a guitar that, that has a bit of history to it, that has a bit of patina, you know? That's a very bold move for, for like a team getting his first, like Les yeah. Paul to do that. Well, I knew, I knew it was a keeper and I knew what I wanted. So, you know, it's... Um, I, I did that, and then a couple of months later, I, I, I heard there was a guy in Belfast who could actually work on guitars and uh, repaint them and whatnot. So I, I saved up my pennies, and I wanted humbuckers. I wanted, like, full-throated humbuckers. So I, I took it to this guy. I had him put a DiMarzio X2N in the bridge position. Awesome. And um, I had him painted this matte black. Wow. Uh, and I had him put in a brass, there's a brass jack plate. We put a brass nut in the guitar, still there. Um, I didn't refret it then because I didn't understand that you could get different fret options. I just thought frets were frets. Uh, but in, in later years, it was refretted, obviously, and it's been refretted numerous times since. I changed the machine heads to shallers. Um, right now, it's wearing Tone Pro's hardware and has done for many years. And well, I mean, every aspect of this guitar has been changed. It still has the original brown color. I don't know if you can see them. Yep. The, that's the awesome. Jacklet cover and stuff. But that, that's about all. That, that and the wood is about all that's original on this guitar now. Uh, and through the years, obviously, I've gone through various pickups. But but the DiMarzio X2N that was in the back, that's what I did uh, Sweet Savage work with. Um, that's what I did the Holy Diver album with for the most part. Although by the end of the Holy Diver album, I was swapping out different pickups because I was in L.A. and you could and everyone was making Do you remember what sort of pickups he used? I have no idea. I mean, I was just constantly tweaking during the Holy Diver album, you know, like changing stuff. Um, I would try anything, you know, um, literally. I mean, I would have different pickups in from one week to the next. Wow. So I guess I had a lot of time in my hands, you know. Well, I, I suppose amp wise, do you remember what amp you were like? Yeah, the first well, amp well, that you got, with, you started with. At first with Sweet Savage, Sweet Savage I had um, a Marshall JCM eight hundred. Perfect. Yeah, was my main amp. Uh, before that, I had something called a Berman. Uh, that was made in England, and yeah, it's a rare bird. Um, and the reason I used it was, well, I had something crappy. It was a Carlsborough. I mean, do you remember those? Not no. Carlsborough. Here, but Carlsberg. Okay, again, probably most likely an English company. Um, and I had one, and you know, it was it was okay. It was an amp. Uh, wasn't particularly good, but but again, going back to Thin Lizzy, and again, Scott Gorham. Um, and this is not to say that Scott was my ultimate guitar hero, but it just so happened that you know he was playing at the locks. I thought that's good enough for me. And I saw him on one of the tours playing these amps called Bermans. And uh, I was ready to move on from this Carlsborough thing, and I'd save a little money to, to buy a new amp. And uh, my local guitar shop happened to have one. So I, I tried it, and it was reasonably good. Um, I had that for a while, but then eventually I, I got a Marshall JCM 800, and that's what I used mostly was Sweet Savage, and that's what I used exclusively on the um, the Holy Diver record. I could never get it to distort enough, though I always had to drive the front, which is partly why I put an X2N in this guitar because I wanted, I just wanted more output at every step in the signal chain. I just wanted more saturation. So um, I remember back then I was running the X2N in this guitar into a little yellow Boss overdrive pedal. Yep. Okay. Drive the front of the JCM Marshall. And that's what I used on Holy Diver. Um, I wasn't necessarily using the overdrive for the rhythm tracks, I was certainly using it for the solos. Yeah, I was going to ask that because the JC 100 is, you know, considered kind of low gain for for modern for modern era. So oh, yeah, it's definitely compared uh, to what, compared to amps nowadays. I mean, there's just so much saturation in modern amps. I mean, it just and, you know. And how did you deal with the volume? Because I think there's two things that 
modern players don't have to suffer through anymore, right? Because that a lot of that overdrive came with volume. So how did you yeah. tame the JCM hundred? Did you put it like mic it in like a different room? I mean, what- yeah, yeah, yeah. We had it in the corridor uh, in Sun City Studios when we were doing Holy oh. Diver. It was way down the corridor, and we were all in the big tracking room. Part part of why Sound City was such a great studio, it had a really, really big live-ish sounding tracking room. And we built a shed for Vinny, like literally out of plywood. We made this little riser thing, uh, just like a, imagine like a garden shed. And you could see Vinny. There was like an opening where Vinny could look out <laughs> at us. And we were all in the room. Like Ronnie, you know, set up a little booth for Ronnie. He was guide vocal. I, I don't think we kept any of those vocals. I mean, Ronnie could sing the phone book multiple times, so it was no skin off his nose to sing a, a scratch vocal for us and then do the real thing, you know, afterwards, which is what he did. So, um, But we were all in the room, so we had this eye contact. Jimmy was was going through Ampegs, but he's also DI'd. I can't remember offhand where his bass cabs were, uh, but I know for sure my – guitar cabs were way out in the corridor and you could kind of hear them through the door and they sounded much better when you listened to them that way than when you heard them really dry and direct in your headphones. I mean, yeah. it was a really uncomfortable sound to play with. There wasn't a lot of saturation, a lot of game. It was bone dry. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. I mean, the rhythms are so clean and tight. And I think, you know, I think gain gets, gets you in trouble a little bit because there's so much it, it fighting, does, so much yeah. noise, you know? It's 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 something that's been lost in in modern music a lot. Is when you go back, I was just this morning. I was listening to Parage by ACDC. Yeah, yeah. And the Malcolm Young's tone is it's practically clean, right? But yeah, it, it just it rings. I mean, it's so beautiful sounding. You know, when it's just like open string chord. You know, just chimes and you know that's to me that's that's the real essence of rock and roll is is classic acdc and malcolm young is, is you know such a great tone coming out of his hands it, so it's deceiving. Uh, but i think i think a lot of that a lot of modern records you know you get you just drive up again cuz it's it's like lubrication it's easier to play with a bit more again you know and and i'm as guilty as anyone is but um you know i always try and and find the threshold like i always dial it back until it's just too uncomfortable to play with right. and then just kind of go with like a, a hair above that when I'm doing a rhythm track, you know, cause I, you want, you want that tone, that chime, that bell like quality to be in there to an extent. And that gets lost when you cross a certain threshold in, in gain on guitar amps. And, and having as well the right instrument to get that sound. So exactly. you had, you had like, the less like Paul. Malcolm used, what was it? The, um, what was it he played it? Was it a guild or something? I should know this because I have one in storage somewhere. I bought one to try and get that sign. Um, or, yeah, or, or a single coil, you know, like if you track. i got a, tele, a 66 Telecaster here that I track with, and it's just like you put a little bit of gain on that. I mean, it's noisy as feck, but, you know, it's it just <laughs> so sings. It's, you know? it's deceiving because you hear a lot of albums that you love, and, you, you know, when it's in a mix, you know, you, you, it almost yeah. sounds like it's higher gain. and. I mean, listen to a lot of like Van Halen stuff. He played with a very clean, light touch, kind of like yeah. an ACDCS type thing um, in the later years. So uh, I totally hear you on the on the game. Yeah, it's a it's a fine line, you know. Um, yeah, Eddie did. Eddie, rest in peace, had had such a delicate. He played like a butterfly yeah. with his right hand. Uh, that was something I could never emulate because all my guitar heroes, starting with Rory, the people I really learned from, Rory and, and Gary Moore were like very heavy handed with the right hand. So <laughs> by the time I first heard Eddie, you know, it's like I, I I was too far down the rabbit hole of having a heavy right hand to ever try and play like him, you know, which is just as well. Because by the time I got to L.A., I realized that every guitar player in California was trying to play like <laughs> Eddie, you know, which is how I think I got the gig. You know, I think Ronnie was surrounded by all these want to be Eddie Van Halen guitar player types and, and said, I don't want that. I want something different, you know? So yeah. he certainly finds something different. <laughs> but, but can I ask, uh, okay, so when you got to LA, you're working with Ronnie, you had your, you had your Les Paul, but we know that as well that you had a Charvel, you worked, you worked with a number of Charvels, two of them. Yeah. There's the, um, that came the Skull and Bone one. Yeah. And, yeah. and one with the graphic of last line. So how did you get into the Charvel? And why well, did you change from the last it, it, it was when we were playing, uh, when we were recording the Holy Diver album, 
Um, actually, it was right before we were recording. We were still rehearsing and writing it, um, all in that same complex of Sound City. Uh, Grover Jackson yeah. came down to the studio. I don't know what the connection was, who invited him or how it happened, but he, he came down and, and he got talking to me about, you know, would you consider playing a strat? Now, bear in mind, when I first heard Eddie Van Halen play, like just about every guitar player on the planet, it was one of those oh shit moments. <laughs> you like to think you're onto something playing guitar, and then you hear something like that, and it's like, oh my god! It's like, you know, the only other guitar player I could equate it to is Jeff Beck. You know, when I hear Jeff Beck, I'm equally inspired and humbled at the same time. You know, it's like, how does he do this? Where does it come from? Um, you know, and you you think of yourself more as, of a guitar owner as opposed to a guitar player. Uh, and it was the same thing when I heard Eddie. You know, it's like. Oh, my God, how does he do this? So I immediately, I had my Les Paul, this particular Les Paul. I thought, I want a hot rod Strat with a Floyd Rose because <laughs> I want to be able to do that. And, of course, again, this is Belfast in the 70s, although it's the late 70s now, but we still didn't have Guitar Center or anything like that. So I couldn't go in. Nobody had anything like that. Floyd Rose was unheard of. It was new technology, you know. You could get them in L.A. You couldn't get them in Belfast. So, um and it was just as well, because if I'd had my way and I, there was a guitar center there, then I would have gone in. I would have acquired a Strat, hot rod Strat with a humbucker and a Floyd. And I would have just been another one of those guys trying to sound like Eddie and Ronnie Dio would have gone. Yeah, I'll go. I'll find someone else. So um, because of the limitations of just playing with Les Paul, I, I continued on that path and and went my own way but when i did get there grover jackson said to me would you consider one of these would you like one of them so he actually gave me this is what happens of course when you're a kid you can't afford shit <laughs> and then <laughs> get a break everyone gives you shit for free so, right. so i was like i'm not gonna look at gift horse unless so grover jackson lovely chap says you know do you want one of these guitars I said, hell yeah i'll take that so i took it but then i felt bad because it felt so so different to this in every way you know, um, in particular, the neck and the fretboard. The neck was was really, really wide compared to this. The nut of the guitar, in fact, the whole way up the neck was just really, really wide. And it was really dry. It was an unfinished maple neck. And I kind of found it really sticky, like my fingers were sticking on it. Um, and then, of course, it's a strap, which just sits on your body completely differently. And so... I kind of toyed with it a little bit. I didn't use it on the Holy Diver album. I took it as a backup guitar on the Holy Diver tour, and I used it one night. I think it was in St. Louis because I broke a string on this, and I went to just – I used it for one song, and then my tech had restrung this. So, And it was very uncomfortable. Um, I, I When I was using it as a backup guitar, I wrapped it in black duct tape to make it kind of look like this because because the guitar was do you remember eddie ojeda from twisted sister had the black yeah. one with the purple yeah, spiral yeah well yeah. that's what the charvel was that's the one that grover gave me was one of those oh. so i wasn't going to play that because that was eddie ojeda's thing obviously and i wanted it to look i don't like new guitars so i, I wrapped it in duct tape to look like this um so i i didn't start using that guitar until we got into writing for the last in line album and then we, we had a month or two whatever in la writing for that and that's when i really kind of put this aside and picked up the charvel and really kind of got comfortable with it and then did pretty much the entire last in line album on that guitar wow. that particular guitar um and then i used that for the tour but in between the album and the tour i had it i sent it back to charvel and they stripped the eddie ojeda finish off of it and they did a last in line album cover on it so and i used that on that tour i still have that guitar but i took all the paint off okay. it's done to the wood now i don't have that one here otherwise i'd show you it's back in storage in la uh and it's actually of all the charvels i've had that is the best sounding and best playing one well maybe not the best playing but it's definitely the best sounding charvel of all of them that i had what pickups did it have oh god i remember having a duncan invader in it at one stage, do you remember that one? It was like, that was the X2N times 10. <laughs> Again, I was just looking to, to front load the amp to try and get more mm. gain out of the Marshalls. Um, so, but that, that was a pretty brutal pickup. I don't know what I was thinking. 
Um, but I tried everything. I mean, I had EMGs active in there for a while. Mm. I know it didn't didn't work out so good. Um, I like EMGs. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry about that, Al. I'm sure. I'm sure they're great, but for me, for that application at that time, it didn't really gel. Um, I can't honestly remember, Sophie, and what other pickups I had in it. But like I said, back then, I was like going through stuff. I'm. I was okay. Through- so, so you were working on the first album you had your last part that's great you were you're working on the lesson line you start working with the charvel so your writing style changed because you have a completely different instrument or did you did you notice the change or your development as a, well, as a I mean, songwriter the big, the big change the only real big change was that i had a wang bar um but i wasn't using it floating i was it was still resting on the wood oh, so i could only okay. go down and I, I couldn't okay. go uh, like a strat okay so in other words the only thing i could do was dive bombing which is so fucking annoying, <laughs> you know, because that's what everyone does. And that's ultimately the reason why I stepped away from those guitars was because I couldn't stop myself from dive bombing. And it just became such an annoyance. Um, so I, I don't know if it changed. Other than that, I, I'm not so sure how much of my style it changed. It, you know, I just had the one humbucker in the bridge position. I didn't have the option anymore mm-hmm. of a front pickup. Not that I used the front pickup too terribly often, you know, and only for occasional parts of solos with the Les Paul. Yeah, so um, we saw that with the Rand's guitars. I don't know how you came to to, to these guitars and what attracted you to them because it's kind of like a more bastard version of, I don't know, like a half off Well, like, you know, this, it, it was it was the 80s, the middle of the 80s. That was a White Snake era guitar. Um, and the only thing I can say about the Rand guitar, it was pointier. <laughs> I mean, this is the era. This is the era of pointy headstocks and wangy bars. So, so when I saw the Rand, it was even pointier. It was even more outrageous looking. You know, I haven't laid hands on that guitar in many, many years. Uh, my Rand is in storage again in LA. But what I do remember is that they had a lot of access up to the top frets, okay. more so than a regular Strat. I can't remember. I don't even remember. Was it a 22 or 24 fret guitar? I can't recall. But I remember that it was easy access the way that the heel was cut away. So, you know, back then you want to play bigger, louder, faster, more notes, more squeedy notes. It, it seemed like the appropriate thing to do. I, I met Rand through somebody. I don't know, again, what the connection was. He was a nice chap. He was an aspiring guitar builder. And this was about a week or two before I was to shoot the video with Whitesnake. Yeah, um, still, still of the night, yeah. I'll give it a go. So, I mean, I actually didn't really play the guitar much, to be honest. I mean, it kind of featured in the video. Now, I don't even have that guitar. He took that one back. That was his personal guitar. Um, and I, I'm guessing he took it back because it featured in a hit, in a hit video. <laughs> so, okay, and, and, and so it kind of increased its value exponentially. So he gave me a green one for it, which is the one I still have. But like I said, I haven't played it in decades. Literally. Okay, so it's the same one basically that the couple of guitar magazine covers where you're holding the uh, the Rand guitar. So it's that's the exact same Rand that you used for the video and the one that he took back. Yeah, yeah. So Rand has its own. Yeah. I think we got to get it back from him at some point. <laughs> No, no, I mean, it's, it's it's all good. You know, all these guitar guys, I've come to notice the trend. You know, they all like once, once you make one of their guitars famous, they want it back. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. And so it looks like there was a quick um, deal with maybe BC Rich and any story behind that? Yeah, yeah, that, that wasn't a good situation in any way. Um, I, I'll be honest, I was never really, A, very familiar with BC Rich guitars and w- in to to the extent that I was familiar with them, the 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 really ugly ones, right? You know the one, the the ones they were known for. That's all I kind of knew, and I thought that's damn, that's an ugly guitar. I don't ever want to play that. So I didn't really have a connection with BC Rich. What happened was uh, there was there was a guy who worked for Charvel Jackson, and he was kind of like my A and R contact at the company when I was using the Charvels, and he left. And he went to work for BC Rich and he pastored me and pastored me and pastored me to try out their guitars. And I know you don't like their ugly guitars. We'll make you a Strat style to use. And at every stage of that relationship, 
things kind of just went downhill and downhill and downhill. And, and it just it ended, it ended really, really poorly. I, I don't even remember a lot about it. I don't like to dwell on it. Um, I kind of feel like I was coerced into a situation with that company um, that was more to their benefit than mine. And uh, so it, it didn't last particularly long. So I just kind of moved on. Is that what attracted you to work with Buddy Blaze? Yeah, I met Buddy at a guitar show in Dallas um, around the time I just joined Whitesnake. And um, we got talking, I headed off with Buddy. Buddy's a really, really nice guy. I, we're still friends to this day. And um, he we just got to talking and, and he, he showed me one of his guitars, which I have here. Excuse me for one moment. Oh, yeah. awesome. You can talk amongst yourselves. I'll be right back. So, oh, that's awesome. This is the original guitar, which uh, I just got back from Buddy actually several months ago. Because um, Buddy has had it for, for many, many, many years. It actually was always his guitar. Okay. You know what I said about all these guitar guys? They went <laughs> yep. to the guitar. So, it, you know, I essentially started off playing his guitar. And this became the night swan, you know, with a few minor, minor tweaks. Um, and Buddy went to work for Primer Guitars. So it, it all kind of just, it wasn't a plan. Like a lot of things in life, it just kind of fell into place and happened. Um, but Buddy being such a nice chap, after many, many decades, he called me uh, just like within this last year and said, you know what, this is your guitar. You should have it. Uh, that's awesome. So, that's the difference in character right there. So, um, so here we go. So I've actually been getting reacquainted with this. And I, you know, thinking back to like the, the, the strings, like, God, I, I play pretty heavy strings now. But back then, I played like ultra light, like beyond ridiculous. <laughs> like yeah, yeah. I was, I was going to ask because the neck is really small. Yeah, if you're gonna compare it, yeah, like yeah, it is wafer thin as you can see. Yeah, you know, and it's twenty four and three quarter inch scale, so it's a Les Paul scale, so it was a comfortable thing for me. Um, and on this guitar, by this stage, I'd been playing floating Floyds, oh, okay. which makes a lot more sense in a lot of ways. You know, it's much more uh, tonal, more musical. I think you can be a lot more creative with it, um, but at the same time, it kind of goes a little off pitch. Right, when you try, yeah. when you try and do double stops, it's like one one string is going north, the other one's going south. It's like, ooh, that sounds fruity. So it does change the way you play a little bit, you yeah. know. Um, but but going back to your earlier question, Sufian, when I was playing the Charvels, I had the bridge resting on the wood, so I didn't have that issue when I did double stops. It was still as musical as a fixed bridge guitar, to all intents and purposes. It's only when I went to floating bridges that it became a little bit. A little bit fruity. I have no idea how I played this guitar back in White Sync days because I had eight gauge on the top. I had a nine in second. I mean, I don't even know how you could fret That's a guitar amazing. like that and, and keep it in tune. So I don't know. What are you I mean, playing now? It, what, what gauge are you playing now? Well, now I've, I've come down. I was up to 13 several years ago. Wow. Um, and then w when I got cancer, actually, and I started doing chemo, and ever since then, to this day, so I have a hard time keeping my calluses. They just don't seem to last as long, and, and I keep having to go back and rebuild them up. Um, so I, I was playing 13 through like a 52, I think, a custom set on the Les Paul. Um, but keep a couple of things in mind. Number one, we, with Def Leppard, we played a half step down. We still do. Yeah. Like. So that and it's a Les Paul scale, so okay. it reduces the tension a little bit. It's not like Stevie Ray Vaughan playing Stratocaster concert pitch with 13s. I mean, that's that's manly. Um, <laughs> so I and then I went down to 12s a little bit. And to answer your question, I, I now and have for several years played a custom set of 11s. I play 11, 15, 18, 30, 40, 50. Okay. Uh, and we play still at half step down, as does Last in Line, the band. Um, I just actually, this could, the, the Les Paul at the moment is tuned up to concert pitch. I tuned it up for a little recording I was doing the other day, and I just, I, I wanted to do it in concert pitch, and man, it hurt. It, it <laughs> does make a difference going up that half step, you know. Um, but I, I always preferred, I still prefer the sound of a guitar in concert pitch. I just think it rings more, you know. 
it chimes again going back to um you know early acdc and malcolm young i mean yeah. that's the concert pitch it wouldn't sound quite as good detune and for all i know maybe acdc do detune nowadays so many bands do right. for the vocal aspect but you know just in in terms of of the integrity of the tonality of the instrument i i much prefer concert pitch awesome. L- looking at your since you brought it up now the the night one itself are you going to play that ever again, do you think? Maybe if you change just the, the pitch of the strings or is the setup of something no. that you're interested no. in? No, I just, I don't, I don't see how. Um, I don't think I have the haircut to match. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, seriously, I mean, it, it, it's so weird. You look at a guitar like that, that's a guitar of its era. That's from the 1980s, you know, um, reverse headstock, you know, cool. kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's... So, and and but more than anything else, it's Strat style with a Floyd. I mean, I just I don't see myself going back to that. Certainly not in the live application. I mean, I've been using that guitar and my Tom Anderson Strat. One of my I've been very fortunate to have several of them, but my original one, the blue one, I have here, and I've been recording with all these guitars. So I do use them in some application, but. Uh, when you talk about going on stage with either Last in Line or Def Leppard, I'm going to have a Les Paul. You know, that's just the essence of what I am as a player. Um, so, so just, you, you, yeah, sorry the to bridge you. thing is just more where I'm at. You know, so you 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 weren't in, uh, involved at all in the recent, I suppose, Kramer release of the Nice One. I didn't even know about it. It <laughs> totally took me by surprise. Like, what? <laughs> I didn't know that, that Gibson had bought Kramer, and nor did I know that they were re-releasing the Night Swan until wow. it was kind of sprung upon me. So I've had a few conversations with Gibson guitars about that. <laughs> um, you know, it's um, I'm very flattered, actually, that they that they bring it back and that there might be an interest in it. I just can't see myself playing it, you know? Okay. It's... Uh, and if I were to play it, it, it certainly wouldn't be blue and polka dotted. <laughs> you know, it might be a bit more subdued. All right, I have a random question that just popped in my head that I gotta ask. So, so, so your buddy Phil Collin has sustainers in every single guitar. Have you ever, ever been interested in popping one of those in or using one, just based on the years of of being together? In a... Yes and no. I mean, I have one of those here. I have a black. Um, PC one, which I've had for many years. Cool. And again, I use it for recording. Like if I'm doing a Def Leppard song and it needs a little bit, I think, oh, I could hear Phil play this part here. I'll, I'll do that, cool. you know. Um, but no, I, I've never really felt the need to do that, particularly, you know, part and parcel of why I went back to playing a Les Paul during the slang era with Def Leppard was, was because I wanted to to make more of a difference between how Phil and I play. Yeah, you know, we're very very different guitar players, um, and you know I, I thought, well, if we're both playing hot rod strats with Floyd, that's you know we're we're kind of bringing it a bit more to the center here, you know. And, and Steve always was a Gibson guy, yeah. you know. So, um, and I, I thought, well, the, I started with the Les Paul, and you know the. The, I moved to hot rod strats in the 80s because of what I was doing. I, it was a little bit more different, you know, from, from early Dio and from Sweet Savage with, you know, with Whitesnake and with River Dogs and whatnot. It was, I was looking for a little bit more tonal variety, perhaps, you know, than what you get from a fixed bridge humbucker Gibson guitar. Um, but I thought, here I am in Def Leppard. I mean, you know, just it, it kind of seemed to make more sense so i went back to that so i i wouldn't see the sense in in putting a sustainer on one of my guitars again that would be bringing it more into phil saying that's his jam that's what he does that's what he does very well so um i do my thing he does his you know it's part of what makes def leppard really exceptional because you have these two guitar players who are, you know, I, I like to think we're pretty accomplished in our own right, but we're also very, very different. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Make it work. But, but, but I'm going to put you to the, on the spot here, and apologies for that. But when you joined Def Leppard in the, in the early 90s, you were playing at Tom Anderson. Correct, yeah. Yeah, because I came from playing in the River Dogs and Shadow King at that time. Yes. That's, that's where I was at. Um, so it, it was a, a process of, of just moving, transitioning from one set of requirements to another. When I also, when I, when I 
played with Leopard for the first time uh, when I was auditioning for the band at a rehearsal studio in L.A., I, I brought in my Bob Bradshaw rig. And okay. my this was the rig I used with River Dogs and with Shadow King. And to a certain extent with, with, with White Snake as well, because I started my Bradshaw rig when I started my White Snake career. Uh, but it developed through the years. And I would say that by the time I was joining Def Leppard, I had an ultimate guitar system. <laughs> I had such a great guitar rig. Hi, guitar kids. I'm Vivian Campbell. The effect system here is uh, a switching system built by Bob Bradshaw in Hollywood. Let's look at some of the effects in the rack. I have Yamaha SPX90, Lexicon PCM70, Lexicon PCM41, a Rain SM26 mixer, another SPX90, a Rocktron Exciter Imager, Roland SRV2000 Digital Reverb, another line mixer, Lexicon PCM70, Furman PQ3 Parametric Equalizer, Rocktron Compressor Limiter, Chorus, TC Electronics 2290, multi effects, DIVL Pitchwriter Guitar Synthesizer. And in the very bottom and around the back where you can't see, I have two Rocktron 2C Hush units to keep it quiet. In the far rack here are the amps that I use, two Randall RG100 preamps. I run those through a Mesa Boogie Strategy 400 power amp. That is my equipment. Unfortunately, I didn't think to keep it intact. I, we started, well, here's the story. So I, I go in and I'm playing, the, the band Leopard had just finished recording the Adrenalize record and hadn't done any live shows since, what, 1988. Um, so it had been a few years. And during the recording process, Phil had gotten into playing most of the record with these little Digitech things. I can't oh, no. remember what they're called. Okay. Rockman? There were, there were, no, we did the Rockman as well, yeah. but the little single rack mount Digitech. Okay. I, I'm embarrassed that I don't know this, so I'm sorry. We're all, I, can't remember, I can't remember what they're called, but the, but it was a very narrow kind of bandwidth. It's a leopard thing, you know, like all the low end, uh, particularly when recording with leopard, and particularly on those classic records, you know, there's so much low end in the bass and the drums, right. and the guitars, you know, kind of sit somewhere above that in the mid range, and because there's so many layers of guitar. The, the the frequencies are very specific, mm -hmm. which is why, you know, over those classic records, Phil and Steve used Rockman's as well as these Digitex, as yeah. well as Gallant and Kruger's. These certain little things that maybe on their own don't particularly sound great. You know, you don't plug into one and hit a big heroic par <laughs> chord and go, wow. You, you hit a chord and it goes, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so... So this is what Phil was playing through. So I, I wheel in my Bradshaw rig when we're when I'm auditioning, and it's a stereo rig. Like I've got two racks, like full on refrigerator size racks. One is full of effects, like really good stuff, like Eventide harmonizers, Lexicon PCM seventies, you know, some really good analog gear, and two amps in the other one running through a, a Mesa Boogie Strategy yeah, four hundred stereo power amp. Wow, you know, it was a because I'm this. Like River Dogs, you know, I was the sole guitar player. Rob Lamoth, the singer uh, in River Dogs, played either acoustic or a clean Telecaster. So I had all this sonic space to fill in around it. When you come into Def Leppard, it's a very different thing, you know. And Phil, coming out of the studio, was was using these Digitex that just have this very narrow mid rangey bandwidth. So so we're playing, and Phil comes over to me, and you know Phil, like he's such a nice guy. He comes yeah. over and he's really polite, and he's like. Can you just turn it turn it down? <laughs> I was like, okay. I'm like, sure, yeah, no problem. I turn it down. He comes over after the next one. I'm really sorry. He says, Can you just turn down a little more? Like, I go, okay. And, and he comes over the third time and he's like, okay. He says, I realize it's not the level of the volume, it's just the overall, like the sound of that rig. You know, he and then he said, would you mind having to go through the Digitech? So, so that's kind of how it started. So we were getting ready. We went on and rehearsed for, for the Adrenalize Tour. And during the couple of months that we took rehearsing, when I was just joining the band, we essentially built a new Bradshaw rig for me to tour with. Uh, but it involved, unfortunately, plagiarizing my existing rack. With benefit of hindsight, I would have started totally from scratch and put that other one away and left it intact because it was an almighty, wow. very, very fine-tuned, exceptionally sounding guitar rig. And um, 
and now it's just in bits. You know? so, wow. Uh, so, so yeah, so that was it. So we did the whole Adrenalize tour doing the Digitech Rockman stuff, and it worked for that tour, you know, and, and playing in the round and all that. And then from the slang era, we kind of went back to using, like, Marshall amps and old-school tube amps and stuff like that. And ever since then, it's become a different sort of hybrid of, of these different things. But, but yeah, that was – I don't know how we get started on this tangent. Sorry, no, we I, love this. We love these tangents. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I That's mean, we don't want to – the rabbit hole on that. No, we, I love all that stuff. Um, I don't want to go too far ahead because obviously you're using – the axe effects now i'm kind of like an amp purist so like um, you know i fight with people all day on the internet about this stuff um mm -hmm. you know um so you're using the axe the axe effects now so what's what's that like in compared to the old rig and the the, the, the valve amps and well we should clarify that i'm using that with def leopard but i'm still using tube amps with last in line um i'll, I'll just do the last in line stuff first because it's real quick and simple my rig for last in line is this Les Paul, a cable, because I don't run a wireless, into a Dunlop Hendrix wah pedal, into the front of an angle Richie Blackmore head, oh. into a 412 cab. Now, sometimes I use a splitter box and go into two amps and two cabs, but that's the rig. That's awesome. It's so simple that even I know how it works, and I can set it up. It's it's bonehead simple, and it's bonehead simple for a reason. Number one, because it, it serves the purpose of that band, and number two, we work on a shoestring budget, so we don't have a million techs to fix stuff, and I just got to keep stuff working. So, um, And I love the sound of that. It's all about – I've got no effects other than a wah-wah. It's all about switching pickups, rolling volume, and it's so loud – you know, we talked, we touched earlier about volume, yeah. going back to the Marshall JC 100s yeah. I am very, very, very adept at shutting volume on a Les Paul. Like, uh, even in the Leopard uh, situation, like playing Pour Some Sugar on Me, yeah. gung, 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 I could be shutting volume off in between the chords, E chord volume off, A chord volume off, wow. B chord. I mean, I did that for so many years. I don't have to anymore because our stage volume has come way, way down. But for many, many years, I did. And going back to the Dio days and the Sweet Savage days, it's a skill set that you acquire. Um, and it's interesting. Uh, sorry, I'm going to divert off on something else here because uh, with Last in Line, we occasionally have, when we do our club shows and small theater shows and stuff, we occasionally have uh, contest winners come up and play a song with us. And frequently, they're guitar players. And they come up and they plug into my spare amp and they play, and these guys, there's a big difference between playing on stage and playing in your bedroom. Oh, yeah. And that's when you really realize it because these guys come up and they go, dang, and the amps just like harling at them. And they, they can't, you know, they're so used to playing with a controllable volume where right. they don't have to work the volume. Yeah, yeah. But when you play live on stage with a guitar th through a hot amp like that it's like wrestling a tiger yeah you know you got to be constantly working your hands are constantly busy it's not like sitting in your bedroom playing along with a record so uh, it's a real world difference you know um and with with leopard um i've never used the the angle amps with leopard i still use the angle cabs um but we you know we've been through a bunch of different gear with leopard and and Several years ago, we all settled on using the fractals. Yeah, the fractal. They're called, right? Okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> you have to forgive me. I don't, I don't know a lot about my leopard gear. I mean, I always tell Wolfie, my tech, that, that my responsibility ends at the jack plate. Nice. You know, like I, I'll handle the guitar. <laughs> Everything else is up to him in terms of the signal path, you know. And between him and Ronan, our front of house guy, they kind of figure out more of this, less of that, whatever it is. It's all the same to me. You know, um, the fra I've never been a fan of digital stuff, you know, uh, even the early fractal stuff. I mean, it never sounded quite right to me. I always prefer a tube amp right. if possible, yeah. you know, yeah. but but I get it. A couple of things now. Number one, the technology is, has come on so far that it is so, so much better than it was 10 years ago or even five years ago. Right. Uh, and number two, in a band like Def Leppard, you really, there's a lot of benefit to having everything be in one box where, where the parameters are so controllable mm -hmm. and so nuanced. Um, you know, that's not the sort of thing I would need for last in line 
or want to use for last in line. But, but what I use and need with last in line wouldn't necessarily work very well with Def Leppard either. So it, it really is horses for courses. Um, and uh, a big, big plus for me is I don't have to run the technology. Like I said earlier, it's right. there's growing to take care of that stuff because I really it's just not something I've ever really been particularly good with. Uh, and even thinking back to my killer Bradshaw rig that I had in River Dogs days, um, back then I had a lot of time to get to learn that, and it became familiar to me. Um, and plus, all the cables were color coded, so it was, <laughs> red went to red, blue went, to, you know, so it was idiot proof. I mean, but I, I, it was the closest I've ever come to actually understanding the signal path through a complicated rig. Yeah, um, you know, and. I can understand the signal path for my last in line rig because, like I said, it's just utterly direct. It couldn't be more direct. Um, but so I, I tend not to get too involved in how stuff works anymore. Yeah. Um, okay. So talk that's that, that's something that that started from Def Leppard day one, and it goes back to the fact that um, on my first tour with Leopard, uh, the Adrenalized tour, we were playing in the round, and we had three mic positions each. So uh, rather than have three duplicate pedal boards and all the attendant complications with all that extra cabling, we have the techs hit the, the pedal changes for us. So they're all underneath. So they rehearse with us and they know wow. whether to hit it on the beat or off the beat. It's amazing. Um, and so th there, there's this inherent disconnect between you and your gear or at least it was for me in the leopard situation. And to be honest, I don't mind that. I've, I've really become used to that in, in, in how I play with leopard. I realize that the only control I have over my sound is, is in my hands, you know, out of That's my voice, awesome. obviously, but, but it's not like I can decide, Oh, I'm going to kick a little delay in here and step on the <laughs> pedal. Or I'm going to try this. The only thing I have on my feet is a wah pedal. I don't pay a lot of attention. If it sounds good in my ears, if it sounds good to Wolfie and Ronan, it works for me, you know? Awesome. And like I say, the, the leopard thing, we need so much variety. Delays have to be specific, tempo specific to the song. You have a little chorusing here. You need a clean sound there. You know, you need stereo here. You need mono there. It's, it's, it's what works for Def Leopard, you know? Awesome. Okay, looking at Last in Line, because you mentioned them and you said that it's, the rig is very simple for you to operate and manage. So looking at that, what kind of your focus was sonically for last in line were you trying to replicate or do the Dio kind of era sound your way is like um, is it what i really wanted the albums to sound like or maybe if if, if going back in hindsight or, or looking back at it i'm gonna do it this way it's my way well yeah i mean tonally obviously there's a, there's a lot more gain in a, an angle blackmore head than there is in a jc i made 100 marshall so Right off the bat, I don't have to run an overdrive or anything in the front or use such a hot pickup. So uh, that that makes a big difference. I mean, I, I kind of I wish in 1982 when we were doing Holy Diver that Angle had that amp and I was able to use it. That would have made a considerable difference. Um, but no, I mean, nothing about the last in line project was specifically geared to try and recreate anything. Uh, tonally, but but I, I will say that I did uh, go out of my way to learn my old guitar parts because yeah. when, so, when something's been on a record for 35 years or more, um, it becomes part of the song. And when people hear the song, they it's in their ear. When they hear the lyric, they want to hear the lyric and the vocal as close as possible. They also want to hear the guitar solo as close as possible. Yeah. You know, they don't want to hear something else so so i knew i had to go back and relearn those solos and it it took a bit of effort but i'm really glad that i did it because now i finally get to play them properly because i never <laughs> felt that i did them as well as they could have been done back in the day um so now i really get to finesse you know rainbow in the dark and stand up and shout and egypt all those egypt all those solos i i get to make them even better i get to hit the the the, the phrases and the marks and the notes where they were, but I get to really kind of fine tune it. Um, and I, I'm really pleased with my playing, especially with regard to the last in line stuff. In fact, no, overall, actually, 
I feel, and probably as a result of Last in Line and the work that I've done on it over the recent years, I actually feel I'm playing guitar better than I've ever played in my life. Um, and I'm much, much more comfortable in my own skin as a guitar player than I was, you know, 30 something years ago, 40 years ago, however long, long fucking time ago. <laughs> Too long. Um, you know, so so that's good. And that's that's the great thing about being a musician is is unlike an athlete, you know, there's there's no finite window of time for your career. You can get to make it better. And I'd okay. like to think that's true, not just for me, but in fact, for for all of us in Leopard, you know, I, I just think with Leopard, like from tour to tour, the band just gets stronger and stronger, especially in terms of the vocals and stuff. You know, we just get uh, we get more more finessed at it. I'm going to pat myself on the back now. Yeah, well deserved. Well Aren't deserved. he great? Yeah. Okay, so you're, you're, you spoke now about vocals. So that's going to relate in a way about your songwriting. Because your songwriting has evolved. It changed, not mm -hmm. just because of the instrument, but because as you get on, as you get more experienced, as you get yeah. more mature, all these kind of elements of life comes into it. So we've noticed a couple of things. I'm going to name them. Clock. Yeah. So your project in Clock in 98, this beautiful set of songs that one of them were being adopted, leopardized, or wherever the term might be, which is to be alive. Mm -hmm. Looking at that song and then how it evolves your songwriting on from like year on year, album by album, even to when you decided to do your first solo album. And strangely enough, it wasn't a original material you're doing a covers album that was really i have not to say i was really surprised and why did you choose to do a covers album rather than doing an all original material we can go back and talk about the clock stuff in a while but the the blues album was an accident i mean it, it wasn't something i set out to do it was something that kind of just happened um i was doing a charity thing for my daughters were really young at the time and, and they were in a preschool and they were trying to raise money for it and so they had uh, a dinner party thing at some venue and they had a band there and they said oh you're a guitar player and i said yeah i play a bit of guitar do you want to get up and do a few songs I said, sure so i ended up getting up and doing a couple of blues songs i think i did crossroads or something like that um and one of the other parents was a, a keyboard player but also a, a record producer and uh, he said to me after he said, wow, he said, I, I didn't know that, you know, you could sing. And I said, yeah, well, you know, I work on it a lot. And, and I have done. I've worked on my voice a lot post Dio onwards. I've really, you know, I've worked with a lot of singing coaches. I, I'm not a great singer, but I I've learned to develop the instrument to an extent. Um, you know, some the really great singers are, are born natural you know like ronnie dio and, and lou graham and and those people you know the rest of us kind of work at it um so so i've worked really hard at it and and so this guy tor was him tor hines and tor said to me said you know you, you, your voice really kind of suits the, the bluesy vibe he says i'm a record producer like well, what if i were to go and see if i can get you a record deal would you be interested in doing a blues record we could knock it out pretty quick and i said sure yeah let's go so tor went out he he got a deal with sanctuary records you know, for minimal budget, um, m me being an idiot decided let's record it live just to keep the essence of it. And the reason why I'll tell you why I wanted to do that, because one of the best records of Eric Clapton's career that I've ever heard was from The Cradle, which is his live blues record. So it's live in the studio. And it's just the fact that the record is live to me as a guitarist, as a musician, and to hear people play in real time, you can tell the difference. You can tell if it's cut live or so whatever. And so I, I really kind of wanted to capture that. Um, but in hindsight, I'm not so sure I would have done that again <laughs> because I'm not uh, as good or as developed a singer, or I certainly wasn't at the time. Maybe I'd be able to do it better now. Um, so it, it's a fantastic a challenge for me to do that. No, it, it, like with all honesty, it is a fantastic album. It is surprising to see that, okay, you, you, you chose a, a covers album, but it, it is fun. sonically the choice of songs, even love the kind of like the inner notes that you have for guitar nerds about what exactly you used on each yeah. song. Yeah. That's great. 
Well, because I, I would have, as a guitar kid, I would have loved that stuff to be yeah. able to read what guitar, what amp, what you played through. You know, I, I would have creamed over stuff like that when I was a kid. So that's yeah. that was a nod to my youth to put that out. Um, the I, I was happy that it was a blues record in some way. I was kind of unprepared for it, but we had the best part of a year from when this concept was discussed to when it became an eventuality. So during that 10 months or whatever it was, I totally immersed myself in the blues. I, I went deep. I, I discovered stuff I'd never even heard of before. And one thing would lead to another, would open another door, and you'd hear these amazing artists that that you'd never heard of and with funny names like Snooky Pryor and <laughs> stuff like that, you know? So, and then, you know, I went back, you know, and I, I touched on my earlier guitar heroes. I mean, I knew that that Rory Gallagher was heavily influenced by Muddy Waters. And I knew who Muddy Waters was, and I heard a few tunes, but I never really had gone and explored the catalog. So so it was a great adventure for me as a guitarist and as a musician to discover my hero's heroes and whatnot, you know. Um, but I, I still, you know, I, I haven't listened to a record in a long time, but when I, when I listen to anything that I do, and in particular when I listen to that, I... I you know, I kind of cringe. I get uncomfortable in my seat and I'm squirming a bit. You know, so I, I always hear, I always tend to hear what's wrong with stuff as opposed to what's right with it. You know, um, and so like I said, I haven't listened to that record in many years, but maybe I'd listen to it differently if I went back and listened to it today. I don't know. So yeah, well, well, hopefully it gets released on Spotify or something because it's. Not I, you see, I don't know the business side of 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 music business totally escapes me. It goes over my head. I always leave that to the grown ups. Um, I don't know what's happened to that record. It was a seven year license. So it should have come back to us in seven years, which would have been, when did it come out in five? So it would have been 2005. 2005 yeah. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, last year when I was in Europe or year before, I can't remember with COVID, I have no idea what year it is, but recently I was in Europe, uh, doing a show and, and somebody showed me, uh, a copy of that record that had been re-released on a French label. So I don't know the legality of all that. Um, there's money on the table there somewhere, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, my kids can figure that out when, when I'm dead and gone. <laughs> so, yeah. I, so want, I wanted to ask a question kind of, you know, in line with talking about the songs and everything you've played on. So, and I don't even know if there's an answer to this question, but, you know, what would you say to someone who's never heard Vivian Campbell? And and what would you point to them in terms of everything you've recorded and everything you played on to say, this is de definitive Vivian Campbell? I, it, that may be a tough question because it's a progression. But do you look at certain things uh -huh. and say, this is really pure me? This is who I am? Well, first of all, I'd say you're lucky. You've never heard me. Um, <laughs> you've dodged that bullet. So. <laughs> Luck of the Irish. Um I don't know. I mean, I, you know, it's, I think the, the, my, you know, we all change like from, we're not the same person we were when we were 15 as when you're 25 is when you're 35, 45. I'm 58 years of age right now. I mean, I get up in the morning, I listen to Chopin and I have done for most of the last year for whatever reason, I can't get enough Chopin. So I would never have done that when I was 15. You know right. what I mean? When I was 15, I'd get up, I'd be cranking Gary Moore and Rory Gallagher. You know, it's it's a different kind of thing. Um, so, you know, when I was 15, I had no interest in singing. When I was 25, I had a real interest in singing and a great affinity and a great appreciation for Motown soul singers in particular. Um, you know, so things evolve. And, and you know, Sufian, as you mentioned earlier, the clock project of the late 90s, you know, that was much more about songwriting and melody than it was about guitar playing. I mean, there's a little bit of guitar playing in there, but it wasn't, you know, my, my main focus with that project. I was trying to expand my horizons as a songwriter and as someone who could maybe sing them as well. Um, so I, I don't know if I could point to any one thing and say that's definitively me. I mean, if you want... The def I mean, I am known mostly as a rock guitar player, so I, I guess if you had to distill it down to one thing, you know, I would say the early Dio albums probably encapsulate what I'm about, or or more recently with Last in Line, in particular the Last in Line two record, yeah. our last record, um, I really think is is some of my most focused playing. 
Um, but then again, I go back. I haven't listened to River Dogs in many, many years. But every time I do, it, it blows my mind. And I'm thinking, how the hell did I play that? <laughs> oh, so, I mean, there's, there's some stuff on River Dogs record that's just like, my God, I, I don't know. I was kind of in my stride back then, you know. Um, so, I, I don't know. Yeah, it's that's hard great. Hard, that's a great it's answer. It's hard to have that objectivity. That fits nicely to my next question. So, okay, so you're saying you get amazed at some of the stuff that you've written. Solo-wise, when you write it, when you come, approach a solo, do you just, do you think about it? Or do you not I need to write a solo or do you just blast it? Here's a story. <laughs> so um, the very first solo I recorded with Dio on the Holy Diver album was the solo for Rainbow in the Dark. So the night before, <clears throat> we were leaving the studio and Ronnie said to me, so he said, Viv, I think we should start recording guitar solos tomorrow. Which one do you want to start with? And I went, uh, let's go Rainbow in the Dark. Why not? You know, so um, I came in early the next day in the afternoon. I knew we were going to cut the solo that evening. A normal person might think, OK, I'm going to construct a solo here. I'm going to know where I start, know where I go, know where I finish. Not muggins here. I had... <laughs> Another cup of coffee. I used to smoke back then. Another cigarette, another cup of coffee, another cigarette all day. Like I'm a caffeine fiend, as if you can't tell. And all I'm playing in A minor, which is the key of the song, all day. I'm not thinking about constructing a solo. I'm just playing in A minor. Everything I'm doing, A minor, A minor, more coffee, more cigarettes. It's time to do to the solo. Uh, we get a bit of a guitar sound going. Roll tape, bang. The one that is on the record is the very first take. Whoa. And that's that's what Ronnie said. He went, wow. He said, that was fucking amazing. <laughs> that's that's awesome. Ronnie's exact words. He said, do you want to try another one? And I went, yeah, okay, Mr. Dio. You know, <laughs> kind of like thinking. And now I'm panicking. I'm thinking, what was wrong with that one? <laughs> Shit, fuck. And now I'm having to think about it. I'm going, okay, I started there. I can't start. i got to think somewhere else. And so it's, it's all of a sudden becomes mental. So I do one, and it's like, eh. And Ronnie goes, eh, we're just going to keep the first one. <laughs> so, so that... That was great and all that that happened, but that kind of put me in a false sense of security, thinking I don't need to figure out solos. Okay. All I got to do is be up to speed and kind of play guitar and drink a lot of coffee. Um, and it never happened. From from then on, it was downhill because every other every time I tried to do that, it, it kind of didn't work for the most part. Um, and so I really had to start thinking about constructing solos. And to fast forward to today... Um, I absolutely construct a guitar solo. Um, I prefer doing it on my own. I don't like the pressure of people being around me. I like to have a little time to kind of go over it and go over it and make my mistakes on my own time rather than in public view. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I absolutely try and think it out. Maybe not 100%, but certainly close to 90 or something and then let a little bit of, you know, serendipity work its way in there but uh but it, it was really it was a false sense of security thinking you know rainbow in the dark solo came out great very first take i'm thinking well i got this shit done <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't always but, work like that. but that's the magic i mean that's what people love those stories because it's like it's those moments when there's something else going on you know and it's meant to be and that's that, that's what makes yeah. it magical those old those albums I, I guess you know the 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 one thing i take out of that is that you really can't think about it because from the second one i was really oh shit you know now i gotta do it i gotta <laughs> think 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 you know funny enough i, I heard something that steve lukather did the other day and i i not even too sure what it was it was a youtube video and i was i was watching car videos on youtube and so you know youtube knows what you like so it threw up a guitar thing to me and Man, it was, a, you know, because Luke was such a great studio player, session yeah, player. Yeah. And I think it was a Lionel Richie track, like okay. at the end of a Lionel Richie song. And he's just wailing for like three minutes or something. And it's all like, there's no way he worked this shit out. It's entirely spontaneous. Uh, and it's so fluid. It's so fucking good. It was like mind blowing. And it's like, you know, there's a lot of great, great guitar players out there, you know, because you don't always think of someone like Steve Luker thinking, yeah, he's one of those guys, but he is one of those guys. You know, there's so, so many yeah. fantastic players. Within the guitar community, Steve's definitely one of the, he's up there. Everyone knows about him. I mean, yeah. it's just like something special going on. 
back, I remember a couple of got good years ago, I think maybe in 2002 at Lily's in Dublin, I asked you, um, why don't you have your own custom list, Paul? So I, I remember kind of like, I'm not quoting you, but this kind of the answer that you said that the Les Paul is a perfect instrument as is. And everything else that people or other artists do to it is more cosmetic sort of thing. But lo and behold, in 2018, we get a Vivian Campbell signature model. Yeah, no, I, I totally, I still stand by that. It, it's kind of like trying to reinvent the wheel. You know, I mean, the wheel is round. A better wheel is just going to be round, you know, but it's maybe going to be a different size. But um, it is it is pretty much cosmetic. I mean, there's a few minor things. Um, first of all, I'm very flattered that Gibson would give me the opportunity to do it. Uh, for many, 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 many years, I couldn't even get a return phone call from Gibson. Wow. It was just, you know, uh, it, w it was very difficult to, to get in. In fact, I, I keep going off on these tangents. I'm so sorry. No, that's great. That's why I love it. Um, the blues record we were just talking about, I wanted to borrow some guitars for that record. Uh, I wanted specifically a dot neck Gibson 335. Okay. I wanted something big, hollow body, like a jazzy, uh, an L5. So those two guitars in particular, I went Gibson at a showroom in Beverly Hills, and I went there to borrow. I wasn't looking for free guitars. I wanted to borrow these guitars to, for, for a blues record. And... The, uh, the hoops I had to jump through, it was like almost, you know, going to a job interview. Well, well what do you want these for? And <laughs> who are you and what are you going to do with them? And Anyway, long story short, Gibson back at that time was more interested. The reason they had a showroom in Beverly Hills, they were much more interested in product placement. You would see Gibson guitars in sitcoms. You'd see models holding them on the cover of a fashion magazine. The last thing that Gibson was concerned with back then was putting instruments in the hands of the people who use them. <laughs> and uh, this was uh, exemplified by, by the fact that I got these two guitars from only after I'd signed a, a th thick document, you know, stating that they would be returned by noon on Monday the 30th. You know, it was like such oh a weird, God. bizarre situation. And after I took them, they were totally unplayable. I had to take them, and at my own expense, I had to take them to a luthier to have them set up to make these instruments playable so I could wow. use them on a record. So fast forward to today, in fact, in recent years, Gibson's been bought out by a, a young couple guys who are absolute guitar heads and um, wonderful guys. And the whole vibe at the company is so completely different. I mean, it, it is back to being a manufacturer of serious instruments who supports artists who want to play guitar. And so it's a wonderful company to work with. So we have a great relationship going on there. And I was very flattered when they wanted me to make a Les Paul of my own. But I, I did do it back to your point, Sufi, and I really had to think long and hard, well, how am I going to make this wheel go around any faster or better? So um, now I have one of those here also. Here's one I prepared earlier. It's like a cooking show, isn't it? Uh, so <laughs> oh, this is beautiful. my custom model. Yeah. So, you know, how can you make a difference? So I, it is mostly cosmetic, to be honest. I mean, there's a few things that might increase or certainly change the playability more towards my style. I wouldn't say it would make it any better or any worse. It's just different. So, um, but cosmetically, I do like the sort of brushed, yeah, that's as you Americans say, aluminum. <laughs> aluminium whatever you call it um i kind of like that look so we've got that going from the jack plate through the tone pros bridge and peel piece and the pickup covers the exposed yeah. pickup covers and the machine heads um so the um jumbo frets obviously that's a big big difference i use these really wide dunlop jumbos on all my les pauls and um what else do we do differently <laughs> the um the like if you're going to compare it sorry if you're going to compare it to a, a standard Les Paul not let's say or, or a custom Les Paul it is this is actually kind of closer to a custom okay um it's it's a bit of a hybrid the neck is uh was shaped after and styled after a 1978 Les Paul custom that I bought in a pawn shop uh Phil and I we were on the Adrenalized Tour in Nashville and got up early one morning, went into one of those guitar shops down 
uh, Gruens or it might have been Gruens. I don't even know pawn shop. It was one of those. We're in and out of stores all morning, and uh, I saw this beat up uh, seventy at Les Paul custom black one hanging on the wall. And like I said earlier, I, I like guitars that are patinaed. So this one was all worn away here, and the neck was all worn at the back. It had been played, and and I took it down, and and the neck just felt lovely. It felt lovely to play. And uh, I bought it for 400 bucks, wow. uh, which I'm kind of miffed about because I think I could have got it for 200 because uh, <laughs> like, they want, I think they wanted 600 for it. And I thought, I'll, I'll be cheeky here. I'll offer them four. And the guy didn't blink. said, yeah, I'll take four. I should have said, give him two or whatever or give him one. Anyway, uh, I bought the guitar. Um, and fast forward a couple of months. We were flying to Spain to record the slang record. And I flew via Lufthansa from L.A. to Frankfurt, Frankfurt to Malaga. By the time I got to Malaga, I, I checked the guitar. It was in a regular guitar case, one of those brown Gibson guitar cases. Um, and it comes around the luggage carousel, and it's covered in tape. And I thought, oh, that's not good. I didn't put tape on the guitar oh, case. No. And it comes closer, I can see that the guitar case is cracked. And <laughs> so... Needless to say, I, I opened the guitar case. I take a tip off, open the guitar case. The entire body of the guitar was split down here, either oh side. The, the tailpiece and the bridge were smushed into the wood with oh. the back. Up. Um, and the only thing that was intact was the neck. And I don't know what it was that Lufthansa thought I wouldn't notice. But <laughs> <laughs> like when I went to play it, and it you goes, just glue it back together. Oh. Well, that was a bit of set take. What about, the, play, what? what about the so, weight on those? Because um, like I have the Epiphone model, and it's it's pretty hefty. I mean, do you do you kind of ask for a, a certain consistency in terms of how heavy? No, the I, are? I actually wanted it light, um, but the, they they do vary a little bit. These guitars, um, in terms of their weight, you know, there's there's a bit of a swing, like a seven point bodies, eight point bodies, whatever. I mean, I, I try and keep them as light as possible. That was my intent and that was my request. It doesn't always work out that way. Um, so the the neck here is styled on that 78 Les Paul. Uh, Wolfie, my tech, connected the neck to a bowling guitar's body um, a, that was a Les Paul standard body. I think a Jimmy Page style Les Paul standard, whatever that means. And we built this Frankenstein uh, Silver Sparkle Les Paul that I played for many, many years with Def Leppard. That was my main guitar. Uh, the paint job was horrible. Wolfie did that. He's terrible. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, with Tone Pro's hardware, we had the jumbo frets in the neck. Um, the pickups, uh, an SH3 is what's in the back. Uh, the only reason I use an SH3 was back in the days when I was using standard Les Pauls, the pickups from the factory whatever they were uh they sounded fine to me but they i got so much feedback i just spoke earlier about having to shut the volume off between chords dang down volume off dang down volume off so this is back when we played pretty loud before we were all in ears and whatnot um so in an effort to avert having to do that all the time i decided to try a hotter pickup um, some or something that that just didn't feedback quite as much. So, uh, Wolfie and I, after sound check, we went over to Phil's side of the stage, and we looked, and there was no one looking, and we we knew the drawer where they kept the extra pickups, so we opened <laughs> the drawer, and they're all noisy away. And we're like, take one, take one here, run, get take one. So we, so nobody noticed. So we went back over to our side of the stage. We started soldering in an SH three into one of my Les Pauls, and I used it that night, and I was like, oh, this sounds great, and it doesn't feedback anywhere near as much. This is much more controllable. So that's how I started using the SH3. Um, it's not like I did a deep dive into DeMarzio's pickups and, you know, kind of noticed differences between one or the other. Um, this one on the front is a super distortion. I'm not entirely sure why. Um, I think it's because when we metered, it was sort of comparable in terms of output. Because uh, it's a bit of a pet peeve of mine when you switch mid guitar solo when you go to the front pickup and the volume drops. I like it to be as even as possible. So, so these seem to be a good match in terms of the output. Again, so I'm, I'm thinking in practical terms. I wasn't necessarily thinking, oh, it's the the, the tone as such. You know, it, it just it kind of works for me. It worked in that term. Um, what else is different? I put a speed knob here. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. There's a speed knob yeah. as opposed to the top hats, which yeah. is what they yeah. normally come with. Um, I just find it more comfortable. 
to because I am shutting the volume on and off so frequently, I find it easier to work with a speed knob than the top hat. And that obviously is the one that's often on the most is the, the bridge position. Um, ironically, I found out after we'd done this that that was something Gary Moore did to his Les Pauls as well. And I had no idea. And now I go back and I look more closely at the pictures and I actually see it. But it wasn't something I copied from Gary, but it's just a weird little. Uh, coincidence that, that happens to be the case. Another coincidence is the color, because this is called Antrim Basalt Black. Yeah. I asked them for a dull, because again, I said I don't want like a highly polished finish. I want something that's kind of muted and subdued. Yeah. Yeah. And um, Philip, uh, the, the head guy at the custom shop, called me back and uh, he said, I find this color he said i think this is it fits the description um and he says ironically he says it's antrim basalt black and he says weren't you born in county antrim in northern ireland um and i said yes i was so i think that that was you know Perfect. kind of a nice little coincidence between that and the gary moore speed up awesome. um, so yeah that's about it really but you know it, it's it's a great instrument i mean it, it's i i would describe it as being a little bit closer in my experience to a, a gibson les paul custom than to a standard and cool, uh, cool. Yeah. And, and for the pickups were you ever intrigued to do your own signature model um i i never have been because i've never like i said you've probably noticed by now i don't go too deep into details on stuff um but interestingly i i have had a great relationship for many many years with seymour duncan i used duncan's way back in the 80s um and in recent years, I've gotten to know Larry DiMarzio pretty well. And, and Larry has, has offered me the opportunity to work on a pickup with awesome. him. So um, I, I will probably get into that in the next year or two. Yeah. And if we certainly move on to doing another Viv Campbell model of guitar, that would that would certainly be a consideration. Excellent. I would have to put on my grown up hat and Let actually the, uh, pay attention to details. Les, Les Paul custom polka dots. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no, no. I think I'm over the point of that. It was the 80s. There was a lot of hair. There were shoulder pads. and ripped. I mean, there's a lot that went on in the 80s that's questionable in terms of the aesthetics. So, you know, um, I don't think we're going to be seeing them. Unless it's like, you know, black, like tone on Let's tone. Do Let's like do it. Black yeah. polka dot. Very subtle polka dots that you maybe only notice if you tilt the guitar. Awesome. <laughs> Then we wanted to just talk a little bit about, we know we just spoke about the Gibson Custom. Um, we want to talk about the Holy Diver Epiphone uh, model. And so did that come from you talking to them about the Gibson model or was that different? Yeah, that came after we did the Custom Shop model. Um, I'm not sure how we got on that page, but I, you know, obviously this Les Paul is the one that I associate with the most. And so... Um, <clears throat> I got chatting to the head of Epiphone and between one thing and another. And they said, well, can you send us the guitar and we'll take uh, dimensions and spec off it? So I sent them it for a month or two. And uh, that's what they came back with. They sent me a couple of prototypes. I have one of them over there in the corner. Yeah, and awesome. uh, yeah, that was it. So I'm, I'm really pleased with how it came out. I mean, it's obviously it's got the X two ends, which, yep. you know, goes back to its original setup. Uh, that's what they wanted, you know. It, at the moment, I have a matched set of Duncan 59s in 7297537, and, and that's what's been in there for many years because I obviously am playing through a, a different app now as opposed to the JCM 800, so I don't need to drive the front end like I did back in 1982. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Um, Vivian, just last few questions, I suppose. Uh, thank you very much for your time. You said in an interview before that in Def Leppard, the emphasis is not really on the guitar playing, it's more on the songwriting. So nearly being 30 years in Def Leppard now, how did you kind of like notice a change or how would you rate the, the, your, 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 your vocals, your, your songwriting skills has developed throughout these years? Well, I, I should correct that. I know I've said that before, but it, it's when I say that the challenge is more in the vocals, <clears throat> The challenge in the guitar playing is is still there, but it's a different kind of challenge to what to the challenge I face in say Last in Line, where I'm the only guitar player in the band and it's all about playing a lot of notes. The challenge in Leopard um, 
it, it's it's much more subtle guitar wise, but it, it's still there. I mean, we're still when I play with Leopard, I'm still looking to nuance my performance night after night, even if I'm I'm the only one that'll ever notice. And we're we're talking like fractions of a degree, like just I'm still trying to play everything perfectly. That uh, that I think is the Virgo in me. You know, I'm always going to be kind of chasing my tail in that way. Uh, um. And the guitar playing, even if we're playing a reasonably simple guitar part, we're usually singing a vocal melody on top that that has a counter rhythm to it. So it's a bit like, you know, rubbing your belly and <laughs> yeah. patting your head kind of thing. And a lot of it takes just a lot of practice to till you get to the stage where you're not thinking about one or the other, wow. you know. Um, but, yeah, it, it's definitely made me a bit more polished as a guitar player. Um being in Leopard for, God, it's almost 29 years now, it certainly has elevated my vocals. I mean, I feel like year after year, all of our vocals get better in Leopard, um, tour after tour. Um, and mine in particular, I, I notice, I, I do feel like if I were making a blues record today, as opposed to 15 years ago, I do think I'd do a much, much, much better job. Because um, so much of it is mental and just experience and, and knowing, you know, vocally when not to push too hard you know um and it, it's difficult to to actually do that in real life and it's one thing to understand it intellectually but to actually put it in the practice is is difficult and takes just a lot of experience and i, I do feel a lot more comfortable as a singer and i uh like i said before i feel very very comfortable as a guitar player um and the songwriting aspect has just come on leaps and bounds. I mean, everyone in Def Leppard, those guys are such great songwriters, but yet all very, very different. Like, like Phil has a very unique style of writing. Sav has a very crazy, ambitious style of writing that's very influenced by Queen. Yeah. Yes. Be harmonies and stuff. And Joe uh, just has a very simple style of writing uh, that's just all based on the melody because he's a singer. He thinks of it from a lead singer's point of view, as opposed to overly complicated guitar parts, which is, has been a thing. I, I think that's, that's one thing being in, in Leopard has really kind of brought me along as a songwriter a lot more. And, but, but having said that, like when I write songs with last in line, it's a totally different approach to writing. So when I write songs for last in line, I just totally go in as a guitar player and we just try and find a riff or something or a vibe. Um, that doesn't work at all for Def Leppard. Like with Def Leppard, you've got to think about the bigger picture in the song and a melody. You're looking for a hit when you're writing for Def Leppard uh, or you're looking for something other than just a vibe. Whereas when I write with, with Last in Line, it's the process is entirely different, uh, as is the ambition, I suppose, you know. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm very fortunate, you know, to, to be in two – what I consider to be exceptional bands, but also exceptionally different in in methodology and approach, in sound, in attitude, you know. Cool. So we got one last question. What, what, what are we going with? I, I think I'm going to ask you is okay. Um, maybe in a way you've answered it, but I'm supposed to get it in a in a in a new one. What would present day Vivian tell him uh, himself 30, 40 years ago? Oh, God, I would tell myself to just not stress on it so much, you know. Um, yeah, just don't sweat the small stuff. Um, it's it's so weird when I, when I think back to a lot of the things over my career that, that actually caused me a lot of anxiety and none of it is really worth it you know, at the end of the day. Um, and, and just to, to try and be able to take a step back, which I still can't really do. Um, you know, I remember in the, the early days with Dio, I was never, ever, 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 ever happy with my guitar parts, my solos, when I got, and, you know, Ronnie used to say to me, oh, that was great. You know, I really love what you did there. Ronnie, I remember Ronnie used to say to me, oh, Ozzy Osbourne said, you know, your guitar solo in this was killer. And, you know, <laughs> and I think, really, I don't know Ozzy. And, and um, other people could hear what I couldn't hear. And it wasn't until several years ago, actually, once I started putting together the Last in Line project and having to relearn those solos that I, I kind of 
came around full circle and had an appreciation for it. And I, I listened to it and I think, oh, actually, that's, that's pretty good. Now I can hear what it was that Ronnie Dio heard in me as a 20-year-old that, you know, he thought, oh, that's pretty good. I should hire him, you know, because I, I never got it back then. Um, so something to do with, with the forest and the trees and standing too close, you know, <laughs> something along those lines. Thank you. Take a step back. Well, Vivian, this has been uh, absolutely amazing, um, and thank you for, for meeting with us. Um, obviously, everyone's going to be really excited to hear this interview and, and kind of go back into those stories. They've been absolutely fantastic. So thank you so much. No worries. Thank you, chaps. Um, thank, you. Yeah. thank you, Vivian, and hopefully we'll see you guys on the road soon enough, yes. hopefully, if all things stay well, safe. One hopes, indeed. One hopes. Yeah. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you. All right, so peace. Be well. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.